I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to such a wonderful celebration. Uh, it, it's, re it's really uh, a great pleasure and an honor to be here. Nati has been giving us incredible gifts all, all over the years, uh, taught us dualities which have deeply changed the way we, we look at quantum field theory and which have really, really built the playground in which uh, I've been working over, over most of my career by now. Uh, I don't, I wasn't quite sure what one would bring to uh, such an academic birthday, but I see that uh, from the other talks that a, a gift of some, some little new piece of quantum field theory might be appropriate. Uh, so I'll try to uh, present some, some facts and results which uh, might be entertaining and perhaps occasionally sh even shed a little bit of light to some, uh, on some of the dualities that uh, Nati has taught us. Um, so as the title, uh, sorry, as the title says, I'm going to focus on the way dualities act or interact with interfaces and boundary conditions in quantum field theories. Now, <coughs> uh, there are many things we call dualities. Uh, one example of dualities might be a situation where you have a quantum field theory which has some parameter space of exactly imaginal deformations and, and perhaps has a collection of distinct weakly coupled descriptions which are appropriate at different values of the parameters, which we can be matched as you move from weak coupling to strong coupling. Other dualities take the form of energy flow. Uh, we might be given some ultraviolet asymptotically free description of a theory, and then perhaps an effective low energy description of the same theory, in terms of some completely different degrees of freedom. We might have infrared dualities where we're given several different UV definitions which flow to the same CFT, uh, which is and shed light on different aspects of the same, of this, of this strongly coupled and often hard to handle uh, quantum field theory. Or perhaps we can even have a situation like this where the mysterious CFT lives in the UV and we are given, possesses some relevant deformations and we are given a, a description of, of a phase diagram where we are told what kind of infrared free quantum field theories might describe this quantum, this, this UV CFT when it's deformed in a specific direction. And Nadi has given us dualities of all of these types. Um, and these dualities occur in all sorts of dimensions and which has all sorts of supersymmetries, of course. Uh, we, this very, we can go from pictures like this for five dimensional or six dimensional conformal field theories to duality in four dimensions like S dualities, the Saber-Witten effective description of uh, n equal true gauge theories, uh, several dualities for four dimensional n equal one uh, quantum field theories and, s and more. And then in three dimensions we have mirror symmetries with dualities which mimic the four dimensional Saber dualities and merge with level rank dualities of Charles Simon's theory across a variety of different examples, most of which have been uh, discovered by members of this audience. And even some non-supersymmetric uh, versions of these level rank dualities. Um, and finally, in two dimensions, we have, you, know, you can have mirror symmetries, again, cyber like dualities, new dualities involving zero comma two theories, level rank dualities for rational conformal field theories. And all of these uh, lines sort of seem to live in, a, in their own world. Sometimes you can derive some dualities in lower dimensions, some dualities in higher dimension. Uh, but as we, we see, when you start thinking about interfaces and boundary conditions or other defects, you sort of put all these ingredients into play. Now, dualities can be have been tested in, uh, in many different ways. At a very basic level, there are tests involving anomaly matching or perhaps matching phase diagrams. You can take the two theories, subject, to, subject them then to com comparable relevant deformations and check that they flow to the same place. This has been a very powerful tool. Um, if, if you have supersymmetry, then more things are possible. 
over the, over the years, we have learned how to do localization calculations, which really give you exact results, uh, often as, as a function of the parameters of the theory, for things like partition functions or correlation functions of certain BPS operators on a sphere, or perhaps supersymmetric indices, which count protected operators in a quantum field theory. And typical, th this, this, this exact quantities are not just a number, they are very complicated functions, very complicated <laughs> mathematical structures. And their much un under dualities is very non-trivial. Uh, you, you can discover all sorts of fun mathematics just by comparing uh, these exact properties of quantum field theories across dualities. Um, and conversely, the, these matches really give a very substantive check of the dualities. It, it would seem really improbable that should, what should the you know, infinite set of operators of two theories match perfectly well and the two theories would st yet be different. Now, as I mentioned, so quantum field theories can be enriched by defects like boundary conditions or interfaces or line defects or surface defects. There are a variety of extended of ways to deform a quantum field theories by local modifications along some submanifold of your space-time. Uh, these defects play sort of a hybrid uh, role in the sense that on one hand, they, they, they can be thought of as an extension of the notion of local operator, some interesting property of your theory, uh, which you might study. And on the other hand, they, they often have as much structure and, and richness as lower dimensional quantum field theories. So perhaps it's better to think about them as a way to enrich your theory, to add some extra structure on top of your theory, uh, subject to a lot of constraints. And once you have given defects, you can of course ask, can we match them across the dualities? Or perhaps more precisely, can we extend the bulk dualities to dualities which involve these defects as well? So that a typical picture that you might look for is a situation where you have some weakly coupled theory with some boundary condition ascribed to you, which is compatible with exactly marginal deformations, and you might try to follow what happens to it as, as you go to some other corner of parameter space and try to match it with another boundary condition for, um, with another description of the boundary condition within this different description of the bulk theory. Or perhaps you might just have a simpler situation. You might be given an, an ultraviolet description of a theory with a boundary condition and try to have it to see what happens to it in the infrared. Or maybe you can find, look for diff multiple boundary, mul multiple descriptions of the semi infrared boundary conform of a theory. Or even these sort of pictures where you, have, you are trying to predict the existence of some boundary condition for. A five dimensional, for a mysterious five dimensional conform field theory. And the way you do it is by giving a list of boundary conditions in all the phases of the theory with properties which match. Uh, now, there is a notion which has proven repeatedly useful in this, in this sort of uh, uh, research, which is the one of duality interface. A duality interface is more, morally speaking, an interface is which an interface which implements the duality, something which you can carry across with the property that if you take an object in one theory and you bring it across the interface, it changes and it becomes the corresponding object in the other theory. Now, this is a sort of hand-wavy uh, definition and it becomes more and more precise the more supersymmetry you are given. But still, it's, it's rather useful. In particular, if you understand uh, duality interfaces, you can often get a reasonable prescription for how other objects of the theory will transform under the duality, such as boundary conditions. Uh, a way to think about these duality interfaces is that they are interfaces between dual pairs of theories, which are themselves dual to the trivial interface in other of the theories, or perhaps more precisely to, the, to a Janus interface, which is a configuration where the couplings of your theory vary across space. So if I go back to those pictures, uh, oh, maybe actually here, uh, 
I could take this theory with the marginal coupling and say, okay, let me let the marginal coupling vary as a function of the position so that half of the space-time is well described by this theory and the other half is well described by this theory. Uh, in between, I'll find this duality interface, this Janus interface. Or perhaps I could take this, this ultraviolet theory and make the scale a function of position so that on part of the space-time, the original ultraviolet description is still valid at some intermediate energy scale, and in some other part of space-time, I need to use the dual description, and so on and so forth. And typically, if, you can if they can be defined properly, these duality interfaces satisfy the same relationship as the original dualities might. So, for example, if you construct a duality interface from this theory to this theory, and then one from this theory to this theory, you might hope that composing them will give you an interfa the interface between these two theories. So somehow the groupoid, the group or groupoid of, uh, of dualities manifests itself in the properties of these interfaces. And amusingly, it's often the case that if you follow different paths to go to the same place, so if you look at the relations in this groupoid, uh, these are implemented by lower dimensional dualities. So all of a sudden, while you are studying uh, the five-dimensional quantum field theories that Nati defined, you might find that in order to understand the inter duality interfaces, you might have to use cyber-duality or perhaps three-dimensional mirror symmetry when you're studying the behavior of some co-dimension true defects or studying this duality of for them of uh, and equal four super mills might involve mirror symmetry of three-dimensional and equal four gauge theories. Studying the behavior of boundary conditions under sub and theory might require an equal true mirror symmetries, and so on and so forth. So all the ingredients that, that I put in the previous slide start coming together. Uh, this topic is really a bit of a nutty fest. Um, so, um, so today I would like to give a to, to look at a particularly simple uh, example of this, uh, of this phenomenon. So I'm going to focus on a very simple duality. This is the duality between uh, a three-dimensional fermion coupled to a U1 gauge theory, U1 Charles-Simmons theory at level minus one-half, perhaps one-half depending on the conventions, and a three-dimensional complex scalar with a quartic potential. So both of these theories are expected to flow in the infrared to the O2 Wilson Fisher fixed point. So let's try to understand a little bit better how this is possible. Well, this is well understood. This is pretty much how you would define the Wilson Fisher fixed point, perhaps. So you take a complex scalar, you add a O2 invariant potential, you tune your parameters in such, in such a way to state criticality you're expected to, to get a conformal field theory with the true global symmetry. This might look a bit more surprising, uh, but at the end it's a manifestation of universality. It's perhaps, it's no more surprising than saying that, that water at the critical point is controlled by the Wilson Fisher fixed point. This theory, this theory also has a U1 global symmetry. Uh, it's not manifest, but uh, it's, you can define it using the field strength or the gauge field as a current. Uh, in other words, this, is a, there is a global, this theory has a global symmetry which is carried by monopoles and by vortices. So a unit of flux moving on the plane carries charge one under the global symmetry. So the way both these theories, so and again, if you tune the mass of the Fermi appropriately, this is expected to flow to a conformal field theory. The way you can recognize that these theories flow to the, both to the same or true fixed point is that they are pretty much at the same phase diagram. They both have a relevant deformation. Here is the mass of the Fermi, here is the mass of the scalar. And if you turn this deformation on with a positive sign, you, uh, you go to a trivial theory. If you turn it on with a negative sign, you, don't use, you spontaneously break the U1 symmetry. Here it happens because your quartic potential becomes a Mexican hat potential. Uh, 
here it happens because when you give a mass to the, to the fermion, you integrate it away, you shift the Chersamos level. If you shift it one way, you get a Yuan Chersamos at level one, which is a trivial theory. If you shift it the other way, you get a Yuan gauge theory at level zero, which is dual to a uh, circle valued boson and has a vacuum which spontaneously breaks the symmetry. This duality is a member of a very complicated network of uh, non-supersymmetric dualities in three dimensions. And furthermore, it can be readily supersymmetrized. There are super, any called true supersymmetric version of this, where you replace the 3D fermion with a 3D chiral multiplet, and this with just a free chiral multiplet, uh, which have uh, which play an, an important role in, in, a lot of, uh, in a lot of constructions. And so, besides studying this duality, and besides studying, I can study the action of this duality both on non -super, in the non-supersymmetric setup and in the supersymmetric setup. In the non-supersymmetric setup, uh, I'm going to use you know, basic arguments like anomaly matching or RG flows. In the supersymmetric setup, I might use uh, some exact localization calculations. Presumably, non-supersymmetric statements could be derived from the supersymmetric statement by some judicious symmetry breaking as well. Now, defining boundary conditions for this theory is pretty much straightforward. Um, you might, there, there are still questions about how do they, what do they follow exactly to when you go to the conformal field theory? And I have to say that uh, the, the literature is perhaps not, uh, not as complete as I would have hoped when I started this project. But there are some basic boundary conditions whose properties are, uh, are more or less understood. So I will focus first in trying to understand which boundary conditions are available here. So for the gauge theory, so there should two I need to give you two ingredients. I need to tell you a boundary condition for the fermion and a boundary condition for the gauge fields. Now, fermions have a first order uh, kinetic term. So the way boundary conditions look like is that they set to zero roughly half of the components of the fermion as the fermion approaches the boundary. Uh, there are two free choices. The, the fermion brought to the boundary has two chiralities, positive or negative chirality, and you can decide which one to set to zero if you want to have a Lorentz invariant boundary condition. So let me call them B plus and B minus. You might set to zero either the positive chirality part or the negative chirality part of the fermion. The two boundary conditions are not completely unrelated. If I start from one of them and add the two dimension of fermion, chiral fermion, I can convert it into the other with a mass deformation. You can think about this sort of a Lagrange multiplier. If, if I start with a boundary condition for which psi plus is zero and psi minus is three, I can add this lambda as a Lagrange multiplier to kill psi minus and psi plus eats up lambda to become dynamical at the boundary. This is a very useful statement because uh, it allows me to, to get the anomaly properties of these boundary conditions in, in a cheap manner just by symmetry and by comparing with the anomaly properties of the, of the chiral multiple, of the fermion itself. So roughly the idea is that the boundary conditions, these boundary conditions have half the, of the anomalies which a fermion uh, would have with the same quantum numbers. So if psi plus survives at the boundary, the anomalies will be half of the ones of a fermion which charge one chiral fermion with, with chirality plus. So once I pick the boundary condition for the fermions, I can, I can pick the boundary condition for the gauge field. Now there are two natural choices, Norman and Dirichlet boundary conditions. With Norman boundary conditions, you want the gauge group to survive at the boundary. So the gauge transformations are, gauge, are generic functions from, from your half space, half plane into the gauge group, which have whatever value they want on the boundary. And this is accompanied by some but by the normal boundary condition for the gauge fields, which in the absence of matter would set to zero the, the normal component of the field strength. And in the presence of matter, they get deformed to something like this. Here, 
I'm using perpendicular to the node indices in a perpendicular direction and parallel for indices in a parallel direction. It's a bit schematic, but um, it, should, it should suffice. And this, you know, uh, is nothing more than the usual statements you've learned in electrodynamics that, you know, at the, at the, surf, at the surface of a, when you have a boundary, the electric field perpendicular to the boundary will be proportional to the uh, to this density of charge there, and the magnetic field parallel to the boundary will be controlled by the current density on the surface. Now, if you want normal boundary conditions, you need to make sure that you are cancelling anomalies because you want the gauge group to survive at the boundary. So we need to be extremely careful. These boundary conditions for the fermions have anomalies themselves, and plus we have a bulk chain Simon's coupling, which also gives you an anomaly in anomaly inflow into the boundary. And of course, we can try to play these two things against each other. So, in particular, sorry, there is something I, I should mention before I get there. Uh, an unpleasant feature of normal boundary conditions is that they break, at least classically, they break the topological U1 symmetry, which I was discussing, the one carried by monopoles and vortices. The reason is that the condition for a for a boundary condition to preserve a symmetry is that the normal component of the current is either zero or at least is the divergence of a, of a surface or of a boundary current. But for normal boundary conditions, the, the normal component of this current is just the field strength parallel to the boundary, and it's generic. So this uh, is a little bit unfortunate, and we'll fix it soon, because after all, when you, when you study boundary conditions for the O2 model, it's perhaps most natural to study boundary conditions which preserve the O2 symmetry. But anyway, so the simplest thing we can do is we can take the B plus boundary condition, which exactly cancels, whose anomaly exactly cancels the inflow from the bulk. So this breaks the topological U1. And one way you can also understand it is that if you take a monopole uh, just a classical monopole in the presence of a normal boundary condition, and you look at the image charge, it's a monopole with opposite charge. So when you bring the monopole to the boundary, the monopole charge can cancel out. Um, so the, the monopole operator is supposed to become, to be dual to the, to the scalar, to the charge, charge scalar in the, in the dual description. So this is telling us something about how the, the, the dual scalar behaves as it approaches the boundary. It can, the, the charge can cancel, it can mix to the identity operator on the boundary. So the OPE of the charge scalar with the boundary will look like this. Uh, there will be a, a position dependence which is controlled by the dimension of phi. There will be the identity operator with some constant in front, which it's uh, in, not something easy to compute. Uh, but it's an intrinsic property of, the, of, the, of this boundary condition. Uh, this, I believe this is what's called exceptional transition in the condensed matter literature. It's a boundary condition which breaks the ON symmetry of the, of the wilson fisher fixed point, and which allows the elementary field to blow up at the boundary. Um, in, the, in this case, it would blow up in some direction, which is controlled by the choices you made when you broke the O2 symmetry. It's, it's actually a two-dimensional theta angle. Now, I would like to do better. I would like to have under a condition which preserves the true symmetry. And there is a very neat way to do that. Instead of B plus, I'm going to use B minus and just add by end a two-dimensional fermion with the, with the opposite chirality. Now, if, if I turned on a mass term coupling psi minus to uh, lambda, that will, that would, uh, sorry, this is probably lambda minus, I'm sorry. Uh, that would bring back to B plus. But I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm just leave, I'm just cup, coupling, I'm just going to couple both to the, to the three-dimensional gauge fields. And keep in my mind that there is an RG flow back to the previous boundary condition. Now, the beautiful thing is that the topological U1 symmetry is now restored if I combine it with the global symmetry acting on the 2D fermion. This is a very neat phenomenon. Essentially what's happening is that because of the, because the fermion is anomalous, the 
the current for the U1 symmetry acting on the fermion has a divergence, which is the field strength uh, for the gauge field, which is the normal component of the bulk global symmetry, which means I can use this to fix the failure of, of, of this. Now I, I have a current conservation. The normal inflow goes into the, into the fermion. In other words, when, when, when a monopole cancels against its image, it leaves behind a fermion. So this is a boundary condition which preserves the true symmetry. Um, the most reasonable assumption is that it flows to the most general boundary condition which preserves the true symmetry in the, in, the, in the dual theory, which is usually called the ordinary transition in the, in the condensed matter literature. In quantum field theory terms, you can think about it as sort of Dirichlet boundary conditions which set phi to zero uh, at the boundary. So that the, the field, the, the most basic boundary operator is the, that survives is the normal component, of normal derivative of phi uh, at the boundary, which I would like to match with some operator like psi minus lambda. Because as I, as I, as I said, this deformation brings me back to the exceptional boundary condition which is what happens here. If I turn on, if I add this to the, to the boundary Lagrangian, this shifts the, the Dirichlet boundary conditions away from the origin. Yes? So they, they do it for the gauge symmetry, but they do the opposite for the topological symmetry. Okay. So a way to... Ah, yes. No, phi equal to zero does not break the symmetry. So generic Dirichlet boundary conditions will break the symmetry. That's correct. Yes. No, phi is the complex boson. Sorry. <laughs> My bad. So if, if you set phi equal to zero, right, and then you, if you add the phi to that, if you get phi equal to constant, which in the infrared will then flow to something like this. Okay. So this is a, this is a nice duality pair. Uh, it's really something that you can start using as an ingredient in to, to, to build other dualities. You can start gauging the U1 on both sides, adding extra degrees of freedom, combining. Although it's perhaps not, uh, not yet as good as uh, we might want because It is, there are, well, okay. There is another boundary condition in the O2 model which sort of sits higher up in their G flows than the ordinary transition. It, it's well understood for the, Z, for the standard Wilson Fisher point, the Z2 theory. Uh, it's called special transition. I think its status on the, or in the O2 model is still a little bit unclear for numerics. So, but, uh, Let's just keep in mind that there are other interesting boundary conditions for the true model, which would be nice to, to match from the gauge theory side. Now, no boundary conditions are a lot of fun, but I always find Dirichlet boundary conditions are also even more fun. So Dirichlet boundary conditions just set gauge transformations to one at the boundary. So they eliminate the gauge symmetry at the boundary. And they do that by just eliminating the the boundary component of the gauge fields. They're very interesting to me because the, the gauge symmetry becomes a global symmetry at the boundary. That means that if you can follow the Dirichlet boundary condition across the duality, you find the boundary condition in the dual theory, which still remembers about the gauge symmetry in the original theory. So it sort of knows about the gauge symmetries which will emerge, uh, I mean, the, the new boundary condition sort of knows about the gauge, gauge symmetries which should emerge in the original description. Well, okay, I didn't say that quite right, but uh, somehow the dual of the reclamatory conditions knows a lot about the duality and about the decrease of freedom on both sides of the duality. And it often the reclamatory condition, the dual of the reclamatory conditions is a, is a key ingredient in building duality interfaces. For example, in equal force super meals, the, the basic ingredient of, of the duality interface is, is, a, is a theory T1 
T, T of G, which emerges precisely as the uh, S dual of a Dirichlet Banner condition. Now, Dirichlet Banner conditions are interesting, they're also a bit harder to study, unfortunately. Um, in particular, now monopoles can, perf can survive happily at the boundary because the, the solution for a classical monopole is compatible at the boundary, is compatible with Dirichlet Banner conditions. Um, so the dual of this boundary, con this boundary condition will flow to some infrared boundary condition in the O2 model, which has a long list of peculiar features. It has, it preserves the bulk U1 symmetry and it carries another separate U1 symmetry at the boundary with a very specific mixed anomaly uh, with the bulk one. It, it must support local operators which are analogous to the to the field phi in the bulk because it supports boundary monopoles. So it, it seems related to, to, to what, what's called the special, this, this, this special transition in the, in the condensed matter literature, but some extra degrees of freedom are probably present at the boundary. Uh, in particular, I, I believe that there are, that if you, if you try to describe this boundary condition in the, in the UV, you would have to couple explicitly some, ban some fermionic boundary degrees of freedom um, to your bosonic field. If nothing else, because if you have the boundary conditions, the original fermion of your gauge theory can, s can live at the boundary and become a fermionic local operator. So, okay, uh, there is, I, I, could, I could try to say more about this. There are uh, some interesting constructions, but I understand it less, so perhaps I should leave it for, for another time. Now, instead, let's try to generalize this construction to other level rank dualities. So the general, it, well, not the, one of the most, one of the big classes of level rank dualities in, uh, uh, with uh, no supersymmetry is the relationship between a UK and Simon's theory at this level coupled to an F fermions and an SUN Chen Simons theory coupled to scalars and F scalars, Wilson Fisher and a Wilson Fisher with a quartic interaction. Um, now, you know, you, when you look at this, this duality first, you might wonder why? Why should I have an F over true minus N as a level on this side? Okay, why this? Why not some other values? Well, I don't know why, but what I know is that this value allows you to build a very interesting boundary condition, which I would not have been able to build for, for other values. Uh, more specifically, suppose I take the B minus boundary condition for all the fermions in the bulk. So this cancels this contribution of the anomaly. To cancel the whole anomaly, I will add n copies of a two-dimensional fermion. So this cancels the anomaly. The result is a boundary condition which has SUN global symmetry rotating these fermions. So somehow knows about uh, the gauge group on the other side of the duality. And I would, all the, not just the global symmetry, but also all the anomalies match what you expect from the reclaimed boundary conditions on the right hand side of the duality. And you can, you know, you can try to look at RG flows and this, this identification is consistent all the way down to what I proposed in the previous slides. In a similar fashion, I can start from this side, try to have normal boundary conditions for this gauge field. And to cancel the anomaly, I will add, I'll have to add K fermions at the boundary. And now I'll get a UK global symmetry which matches the global symmetry on the other side and the duality also match. So, so I, would I would propose that normal boundary conditions with, ex with bifundamental fermions on this side flows to Dirichlet on the other side and vice versa. And indeed, you can even make a statement about a, a, duali a duality interface. Uh, that's why I call them bifundamental fermions. You can imagine having a UK gauge theory on the left-hand side of space-time and SUN on the right-hand side and that the interface coupled them with bifundamental fermions and perhaps you cover coupling between the bulk fermions 
uh, the bulk scalars and the boundary fermions. And I, I believe that will flow to a trivial interface in the conformal field theory. Now, perhaps this statement looks less surprising if we get rid of the, of the matter fields. Meaning, suppose that we give a mass to both all the fermions and all the scalars, and we go, we go back to the standard Lagrange duality of Charles Simon's theory. So there is this statement that UK Charles Simon's theory level N is the same as SUN Charles Simon's theory level K. This Lagrange duality is often understood in terms of the properties of a two dimensional conformal field theory. Uh, there is this statement if, that if I take N times K fermions, in two dimensions, these are the same as the product of two WCW models, a UK and a SUN WCWs. And you know, if you stare at the problem for a little bit, you can convince yourself that if you, if you take a Chan-Simmons theory, well, okay, it's well known that if you take a Chan-Simmons theory and you put the Clebonary condition, you will get a WCW model in the infrared. But you can convince yourself that if you take Neumann boundary conditions with some matter at the boundary, you instead flow to a corset where you corset away these, these currents from the two-dimensional degrees of freedom. And because of the 2D level rank duality, then you can convince yourself that this boundary condition and this boundary conditions are totally the same in the infrared. And this is just the safe statement with extra matter added. Now, you can ask how to test this statement, uh, besides the anomaly matching and the RG flows. You can do some large N calculations. Uh, I mean, uh, I've been working on that with Radicevic over the last, uh, over the last month. Uh, and you can, or you can try to supersymmetrize. The, these interfaces, manner conditions, have some very nice supersymmetric analogs, uh, which have three-dimensional and equal true supersymmetry in the bulk, and have zero comma true supersymmetry at the, at the boundary. So if you replace your, fun, your fermions with Fermi multiplets uh, you, and your Yukawas with uh, fermionic superpotentials, you can, you can build some reasonable dualities and you can test them by looking at the index, at the boundary index or half index, which is something which counts protected boundary operators. And I've been working on that with the MOFT actually for, for, for quite some time now. Um, okay. Uh, so happy birthday. Yes. Okay. So I can shout. So going back to this slide with the dualities that Aharoni proposed. Yes. Slide. Uh, it was noticed that if NF is bigger than N, there's something wrong with this duality. Mm -hmm. Do you see that from your perspective? I'm not sure. You don't have to see it from it. Yes. <laughs> but, but it yes. Would be nice if we I agree. Is it due to, is it known, I mean, is it due to some monopoles getting a bad dimension or? It's just mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I don't have a good answer. In addition to the, the non-supersymmetric dualities you've talked about, there's been another set of conjectured, perhaps less strongly conjectured dualities about um, um, the, f the bosons without the Wilson-Fisher term mm -hmm. and the fermions with a sort of Wilson-Fisher term. You know, some, an IR yes, theory. Yes, yes, that's right. Can you generalize your, well, your work to that, to that conjecture? Does that work there? Yes, yes. I, I think it, it also holds in that case. Um, in particular, right here you could define the boundary condition with the boundary fermions uh, clearly even if these were just normal scalars and presumably to flow to something on the other side. And here I picked the fermionic side of the duality, but I could have made an identical slide involving a U1 gauge theory at level one coupled to a complex boson 
compared to the uh, gross neveu fermions. Uh, Sorry, just as a follow-up, once again there, the relevant fixed point doesn't seem to exist at small in, small in mm -hmm. at least on the bosonic side. Yes. N has to be larger than 10 or something like that for the theories to exist. So do you see some, do you see issues at small n there? Yeah, I'm not sure. Actually, I'm, I have to say that I, I can perhaps give a partial answer to Nati and <laughs> to you. So I, even ignoring the matter fields and looking at this duality, uh, well, no, actually, sorry. I think this, this is fine for any number of fermions. Yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know. Thanks. If time for another question or comment. Any? Okay, let's thank the speaker again.